Greeks certainly considered these people their ancestors, their heroic forebears. A thousand years before the ancient Greeks, maybe almost 2,000 years before the ancient Greeks, another people lived in what we call Greece. In fact, a people that the Greeks will consider their ancestors, their forebears, the Mycenaeans. The ancient Greeks will look back and they'll write the Mycenaeans into their mythology, into their history. Mycenaeans, this is a distinct people. This is a different civilization. These people were Indo-European speakers, traded far and wide. Uh, they were present in Syria, they were present in Mesopotamia, Egypt, Anatolia, of course, Minoan civilization, lots of interaction there because they're the most proximate and the Minoans were sort of the dominant culture in the region. As they're trading, of course, not just goods are being exchanged, but ideas are being exchanged. And especially in their interactions with the Minoans, we see lots of cultural adoption on the part of the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans begin to mimic the Minoans in terms of architectural styles and agricultural processes and trade and the way they traded, even their Tholos tombs. The, the Minoans built these beehive-like tombs called Tholos tombs. And we start to see those crop up here among the Mycenaeans as well. In fact, I'm standing at the top of probably the most famous Mycenaean Tholos tomb of all, the so-called Tomb of Agamemnon, or Treasury of Atreus. This here is a Tholos tomb. This is the Treasury of Atreus. Massive, awe-inspiring, megalithic structure. You go in there and it's just incredible. The beehive roof, uh, the size of some of these stones, the masonry, quite, quite advanced. And again, very awe-inspiring. No evidence that this was ever a treasury, let alone the tomb of Atreus or the tomb of Agamemnon. None of the Tholos tombs around here, and there are several, uh, have labels or inscriptions on them that identify who, whose tomb they are. Uh, none of them have been found with anything. They've all been looted probably many times over. Uh, this Tholos tomb, the treasury of Atreus, has been open. In other words, it's, it's been unburied. It's been open to the world since the beginning. And so it's invited travelers and looters uh, almost since day one. I'm inside the so-called treasury of Atreus or tomb of Agamemnon. Pretty incredible. Look at the beehive structure of the inside. Amazing, right? Amazing. As I mentioned, no evidence. Uh, of any kind as to whose tomb this might be. Most certainly not Agamemnon's, nor Atreus's, nor was this ever a treasury. But it was never buried. It was always open. And so travelers were, you know, always tempted to come here. And this Tholos tomb, like all the Tholos tombs around, uh, was looted early on. But in an incredible sight, for sure. Uh, the tomb of Agamemnon, or the treasury of Atreus. But evidence that the Mycenaeans adopted, often wholesale, culture from the Minoans. In a nutshell, their chronology goes something like this. Go back to about 1800 BC. Some scholars push it back 500 years to 2300 BC. There is a distinct people living in Greece, present in Greece, the Mycenaeans named after this site. I'm at the site of Mycenae. Very, very powerful, particularly in the 1400s, 1300s, into the 1200s. Very, very powerful uh, citadel palace here. Access to underground water in control of all the area around. Really, really impressive walls. So impressive that the ancient Greeks are going to attribute their construction to the help of giants, of Cyclops. And the son of Zeus, Perseus, according to the mythology, hired Cyclops to help build some of these walls, the citadel walls at least. But yeah, 1800 BC, 
you have Mycenaeans here, maybe further back. Fast forward to about 1600 BC and the Mycenaeans are somewhat dominant in the Aegean and in Greece, competing with the Minoans directly. And by 1490, the Mycenaeans have conquered the Minoans, which is in, in many ways a tragic event if you've studied Minoan culture. Uh, quite an incredible and unique culture for another video. Um, but yeah, 1490-ish, the Mycenaeans have conquered the Minoans. And by about the middle of that century, let's say the 1450s or so, the Mycenaeans have a written language. Now, maybe this is not a coincidence. You know, uh, they conquer the Minoans who have a written language that we call Linear A, which we still can't read, unfortunately. And then a few decades later, the Mycenaeans seem to have developed a written language, which we call Linear B. Now, Linear B is definitely a precursor to Ancient Greek, we're not sure if there is any direct connection between Linear A and Linear B, what the Mycenaeans used. Some scholars say yes, some scholars say no, but Linear B was uh, ideogrammic and syllabic, and again, certainly a precursor to Ancient Greek. So very important in terms of the development of writing and literature in Western civilization and in world civilization. Linear B. So this is a literate people. However, this was not a people that produced literature. Linear B was used almost exclusively for accounting purposes. So no epics, no poems, or anything like that written in Linear B. Then fast forward again to about 1200, and we see the appearance in this part of the world, the Eastern Mediterranean, of the Sea Peoples and other invading peoples, an amalgam of invaders. Who are the Sea Peoples? We don't know. Some people even say the Mycenaeans are among the Sea Peoples. One thing we can say, though, is as destructive as the Sea Peoples were elsewhere, and they were, the Sea Peoples destroyed almost every civilization with which they came in contact. I mean, the Egyptians barely survived the Sea Peoples. I mean, think about that. But they took down civilization after civilization. They plunged much of the region into centuries of Dark Age and arguably the hardest hit region of all was Greece, was Mycenaean civilization. In fact, the Mycenaeans are going to experience a 90% reduction, 90%, 90% reduction in their population. Imagine that. And the Mycenaeans absolutely will be plunged into a dark age. In fact, the ancient Greeks looking back will consider the era between about 1200 and 800 BC a dark age. Uh, again, massive depopulation, little to no written records, uh, little to no monumental architecture. We don't really know what's going on during this period, except that there's invasion, war, famine, plague, and that sort of thing. So that sort of ends Mycenaean chronology. In fact, by the time you get to about 1000 BC, there is no distinct people that we can look at and say, those are Mycenaeans. The Mycenaean people have ceased to exist for all intents and purposes. The Dorian Greeks have pushed down from the north. They've displaced them. They've killed them. They've driven them off. This is all speculation. Anytime we're talking about ancient history, particularly when it's more than four digits back BC, very fuzzy stuff, mostly guesswork. But it seems that the Dorian Greeks had pushed the Mycenaeans, any surviving Mycenaeans, out. Many of them fled across the sea to western Anatolia to what would become Ionia. In fact, what would become Greek Ionia. Maybe they're laying the foundations of a future Greek Ionia. And thus ends Mycenaean civilization. So that's the Mycenaean timeline in a nutshell. But who were these Mycenaeans? Um, for all the mimicking that they did of the Minoans, the Mycenaeans were very different from the Minoans in some fundamental ways. For example, you know, the Minoans tended to be a very peaceful people. They didn't really have much in the way of fortifications or armies or garrisons. Uh, the art they produced was playful or, or a celebration of nature or animals or, you know, whatever. You don't see that very much among the Mycenaeans. 
the Mycenaeans were, this is a decentralized set of polities. There's no centralized state. There's no empire. There's just a patchwork of petty kingdoms, each led by a king or a military chieftain, often housed in a you know, citadel on a hill in an acropolis. I'm sitting on the most famous one. This is the great site here in the northeastern Peloponnese. Uh, dominated the region in the 1400s, 1300s, 1200s. Mycenae, pretty incredible site, visible for miles around up on a necropolis. Heavily fortified, big walls, garrisons, uh, you know, armies, weapons, armor, all that sort of thing. The type of thing you, you don't really see over in Crete. These guys, in fact, seem to have been obsessed by war. Uh, in the tombs of the chieftains, and, you know, a lot of them are buried in shafts and whatnot. And sometimes the walls are painted. And in their paintings, these are not playful. These are brutal often. These are scenes of war, scenes of the slaughter of prisoners. Uh, often these guys are buried with weapons of war. In fact, the chieftains are buried with essentially an entire arsenal of weapons so that they can make war in the next life, presumably. And with miniatures too, miniature chariots, miniature warships obsessed with war. These were military societies who were always at war with each other, it seemed, always at war with outsiders as well. Uh, one reason they never banded together. And uh, always raiding each other, always, uh, you know, militarily competing for control of trade routes and using their armies to expropriate the agricultural surplus of their own subjects. This is how they built and maintained places like this. We're not sure what the Mycenaeans believed in, what their faith system would have looked like. You know, later the ancient Greeks, by the end of the Archaic period, are going to build these awesome temples. And of course, they're writing all sorts of things. They're writing epics and poetry and all sorts of things, expositions on every subject under the sun. You don't see that among the Mycenaeans. You don't even see really temples. Uh, what you do see are shrines in households. Now we can read a few words uh, in association with these shrines and elsewhere in the, site, in the sites, you know, dating back to the Mycenaean period, we read names like Zeus, god of lightning, or Poseidon, god of the sea, or Demeter, god of grain, but not very many. I mean, not much more than that. Later on, of course, the ancient Greek pantheon is going to be massive, all sorts of gods and demigods. And, you just don't see that. It's much more sparse in terms of a pantheon, it seems, among the Mycenaeans. In fact, a lot of scholars think that the Mycenaeans carried on a sort of a home worship of their ancestors, as opposed to what will later develop among the Greeks. Who knows? We, we can't really say because they didn't leave literature behind for us to pour over, nor did they leave temples behind. Whoever the Mycenaeans were and wherever they came from and whatever their actual historical relationship to the later ancient Greeks, the Greeks certainly considered these people their ancestors, their heroic forebears. In fact, you can sort of read into the epics of Homer. Homer, if he existed, probably lived in Ionia, so maybe where some of those Mycenaean refugees ended up in the mid-700s. So this would be many centuries after the fall and disappearance of Mycenaean civilization, but that memory might have still been there. Certainly some of the sites and, and whatnot are still there to be seen and visited. And the ancient Greeks, including Homer, as they're talking about these people, they talk about them almost like they're looking back wistfully at a, at a bygone age that they wish they could recapture. Agamemnon, Atreus, Achilles, you know, all these guys, these are Mycenaeans, okay? When the Greeks talk about their epic age, when they talk about their heroic ancestors, they're actually talking about the Mycenaeans. I mean, the Iliad and the Odyssey in many ways are swan songs to that bygone age, an age of heroes and kings and great kings, uh, gods and men having great adventures. This is a time that can be studied, that can be related, that can be mined for examples of virtue and courage and honor, as well as cowardice and treachery and tragedy and everything else. When Homer is describing the events of the Trojan War, 
You know, he's describing the era of the Mycenaeans. These are the Mycenaeans. When he's talking about people like Odysseus or Achilles, he's talking about the Mycenaeans. These are people that the Greeks will claim as their great noble forebears, whose stories should be studied and passed on from generation to generation.